All right, so welcome everyone. <clears throat> I'm Clarissa. I am going to be your host um, this evening. Um, this is an opportunity for you to um, meet with different folks, including myself and the admission staff, uh, financial aid, to ask your final questions, any thoughts that you may have. And yeah, keep the conversation going in the chat box. Um, I am Clarissa. I work in the Office of Admissions and have been doing so since 2007. I am a regional recruiter that works primarily with our students that are from Ohio and Indiana, but help any student who wants to gather or learn information about EMU. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, today you'll have an opportunity to meet with some of my other colleagues who are the experts also in admissions and financial aid and, and touring our campus. And so any questions that you have, we wanna make sure that today you can leave having every question that you have answered. And so I'm gonna start off first by allowing our other panelists that are with us today to introduce themselves, starting first with our uh, Alex Landon, our Director of Admissions. Sometimes can't find that mute button. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Landon. I serve as the Director of Admissions here at Eastern Michigan University. Very excited to have you all with us. Um, as Clarissa said, we're, we're very excited just to get you in the room and give you an opportunity to ask the questions that you have. Um, we know that right around now, everything's been a little bit crazy. Students haven't had quite the same opportunities to come to campus and see us in person. So we want to make sure that we give you a space where you can just come in and any of those questions that are on your mind as you're thinking about about how you go forward. We want to make sure we get those answered. Um, just to give you all a little bit of information, I always like to talk a little bit about my background just so I'm not a, a total stranger that's talking to you today. Um, I've been at Eastern Michigan in some capacity for uh, well over a decade at this point. Um, I've worked here for about seven years, but before that, I'm actually a, a very proud two-time alum of the university. And I didn't originally grow up in Michigan, though. Um, I am from originally from Southern Ohio um, and, and much to the uh, chagrin of my Buckeye loving family. I moved my way up here um, and I've been here ever since. Um, absolutely love it in this community and, and very excited to answer all of your questions today. Um, I'll do a little bit of a, of a more brief introduction of the Office of Admissions, but I think before we do that, I'll, I'll throw it over to Donna. Well, hi everyone. Um, as Alex said, my name is Donna Hollebach. I'm the Financial Aid Director here at Eastern um, and I'm I think I have like one of the best jobs on campus because my job is to give money away. Um, probably not as much as most of you would like, but it, it's still a pretty good gig. But actually, you know, it is a good job because what I do is provide access, um, you know, to help you finance your education. Um, so what my office does is we basically take the information that you fill out on the free application for federal student aid and we put together an aid package that helps you finance your education at Eastern or you know, wherever you're gonna go. Um, I'm excited um, to be able to answer some of your questions tonight. I know you're gonna get a lot more detailed information when you attend the student orientation and advising, um, the SOAR, but you know, maybe tonight it can get, answer some of those you know, questions that you have lingering before you get to that step in the process. So. Um, welcome and Alex, I don't know what's next if we want to have <laughs> Ashley introduce herself. <laughs> Ashley, we'd love for you to, to also share a little bit about yourself also. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley. I am a certified tour guide. Um, I'm also a senior. I'm graduating in this upcoming April graduation. Um, I come from the College of Education, so I'm finishing up my student teaching right now. Um, and I'm also originally from Ohio area, moved up here to Michigan. Uh, so also have that out-of-state experience, but I'm here to offer some student insight. Um, I will be answering a lot of your questions in the chat. So if you get messages from me, um, it's just coming from the student perspective, but I am excited to be here to answer anything you all need. Thank you so much, Alex, Ashley, and Donna. Um, so here's how today will work. 
We have the chat box, which many of you have started to communicate in this evening uh, with just your hellos. Any questions that you have throughout this conversation, and I like to call it a conversation, because I really would like for it to be interactive as opposed to us just giving you information. We wanna, we wanna um, kind of call and response. If you've got some questions, put them in there. We're gonna respond to them as they come to us. Ashley and I will kind of be in managing some of those questions in the chat box, but um, we want you to also feel free, again, for those of you that are joining us, feel free to take off your, um, show us your faces and, and um, include giving your voice so that we can also hear from you. So as Alex and Donna are sharing um, during their, their part of the Q&A, if there are some questions that are really burning in the back of your mind, don't hesitate to make this a conversation. Uh, we wanna make sure that you walk away feeling very confident and very comfortable with everything that you want and need to know about us. So we're gonna start first by, um, I guess I'll, I'll toss it back to Alex <laughs> in that um, admissions, which is obviously the role that I am in, I'm actually gonna I should have shared when I introduced myself that although I work in the Office of Admissions professionally now, I was also a student at Eastern. I earned my bachelor's degrees in communication and healthcare administration. I minored in African American studies. I also worked as a tour guide while on campus, and I also worked in the housing staff. So while I have this role at this moment in my career, I've also had some experiences as a student staff person on our campus. And so I'm happy to share those experiences with you. So although I will be your kind of moderator for the evening, I'd love to share with you any questions that you may have for me as well. So we're gonna start off first with Alex, if you'd like to share a little bit more about what students should expect and the process for admissions, if, uh, and then we will go to financial aid. And again, keep that, that chat box going. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Clarissa. And yes, I would just say again that if you have questions, just feel free, um, throw them right there in the chat box. You're welcome to just put them out there in the open, um, or you're welcome to send them directly to um, Ashley in the chat box, and she'd be happy to give those to us so that we can keep working our way through them tonight, but we're excited to get to them. I think the first thing we wanted to just take a minute to start out by doing is having Donna and I talk a little bit about how our areas are going to be interacting with you as you continue to go forward. So as far as far as the Office of Admissions goes, I know that for many of the folks that are joining us tonight, you've probably already started working your way through your admissions process. You may have even already completed that. And um, really the question is, well, where do we go from here? So we definitely want to give you a good idea of what the next steps look like for students once they've started thinking about where is my decision going to be? How am I going to pick a college? And then if I do choose Eastern, how do I move forward from here? This is an incredibly important part of the process. And we know that many of you are working through a lot of educational ops and trying to figure out what's going to be next for you. And we encourage you to take full advantage of that process. And the biggest thing we can really tell you from the Office of Admissions is to know that we're here for you. Um, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that you make a decision that is best for you. And obviously, we hope that all of you join the EMU community. But at the end of the day, this is a decision that centers around what's going to be best for you and your family. So we just want to make sure that we can be as supportive as we can. If you ever have any questions, if there's ever anything that you need, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and let us know. Um, all of you can find on our website, which is emish.edu slash meet the staff. You can find the direct contacts for the advisors here in our office that work with your area so that you can reach out to somebody directly. You can reach out to our general inboxes. Let us know if you have questions. We're always happy to work with you, whether that is coming in for a campus tour, or whether it's just sitting down with us one-on-one -on -one to go over your financial aid packages and your options for colleges, the majors that you're interested in, we would love to do those things with you. We know that every single one of you has individual questions, and that's why it's so important that you know that you're welcome to reach out to us at any point. Um, that's why we're here. The other thing that you can think of uh, of the Office of Admissions is we really just consider ourselves a hub for information for you. So when you might be thinking, I have a question and I have no idea who to ask, please feel free to come and ask us. Um, a lot of times we may know the answer, 
And even if we don't know the answer, we will know who on campus can give you that answer. So we'll either answer the question for you or we'll direct you to the place that you need to be to get those answers. A lot of times that could be an office like Donna's or our housing and residence life office or our orientation office, but we can make sure that we create those connections for you so that you have the resources that you need as you're working your way through the process. Um, the last thing I would say is that for any of you who have already taken your next steps, that's amazing. We're excited to have you joining us for the fall. For those of you who are still in the decision process, we want to make sure that you know what those next steps look like. You probably have begun getting emails from us if you've already been admitted talking about the EMU enrollment form. The EMU enrollment form is really the first step that students take to letting us know that they intend to enroll at Eastern Michigan in the fall that they've been admitted for. The EMU enrollment form is actually going to do four different things when our students fill it out. The first thing that it's going to do is it is the official way that students notify us that they plan to attend school at EMU in the fall. The second thing that it's going to do is it's going to allow them to sign up for their SOAR date. And SOAR, S-O-A-R, stands for Student Orientation Advising and Registration. This is an event that we actually hold on multiple occasions. There's 14 different opportunities for students to attend that they start in March and they run all the way through the summer. Students pick a day to come in for their SOAR. And during their SOAR date, they'll meet with an academic advisor as well as actually register for classes. So when students leave their SOAR date, they will actually have their fall schedule in hand. It's a really awesome day. You'll get acclimated with the campus. We also have sessions for parents during that day um, to make sure that you get all the questions you need and wrap everything up before you hit the summer. So that'll register you for your SOAR date. Um, it will confirm all of your information and verify your major. And then finally, it will also register students for EMU Connect, which EMU Connect is our more traditional fall kickoff program. Um, this year that happens on August 26th. That's a Friday. Um, it opens with a move in for our students who are going to be living on campus. And then it's a three day orientation program that allows our first year students to get acclimated for camp with campus before classes start the following Monday. So that's a little bit about the next steps. I know that Clarissa posted in the chat a link to emish.edu slash admit. This website actually has a really excellent um, checklist that you can work your way through. If you're ever wondering, what do I do next? It's all on that list. The other thing that we encourage you to do is watch your email because we are going to be sending updates every time that there's a new step or every time that we need something from you. We're going to be sending that information to you via email. So keep your eyes there as well, because we will try to keep you as up to date as possible. That was way more than the one to two minutes that I promised Donna that I was going to spend talking about next steps. Um, but I do want to throw it over to Donna to talk a little bit about how her office can also support you as you're working your way through your decision and toward enrolling in the fall. Thanks, Alex. That's okay. You didn't take up too much time. And it's all good information. Um, so same thing that Alex just said. Our office is, is here to help answer your questions. Hopefully, many of you or your students have received their financial aid offer in the mail. It would have been like a nice trifold um, showing you, you know, what scholarship eligibility you might have, what, you know, federal grant aid that you might be eligible for, such as a federal Pell Grant or federal work study, and also your loan eligibility. Um, there would have been a series of next steps listed in there, such as setting up your um, EMISH account so that you can see your EMISH email, because unlike you know, the Office of Admissions that can still contact you through your personal email, the Office of Financial Aid is unable to do that. Um, we use only the, if, um, your, universe, your Eastern Michigan University email address. Um, so if we do need additional information from you, because when you file that free application for federal student aid, the Department of Education may have marked you for what's called federal verification where we need to verify that the information that you put on the FAFSA is correct. So we might ask for either a copy of your parents' tax return or proof that you did or did not file taxes, um, a verification worksheet listing where we're asking for like how many people are in your household, 
things like that. So outstanding requirements that are needed in order for us to finalize your aid package. We will send one paper letter home, which some of you may have already received from our office if we do need additional information. But after that one paper notification telling you that, that additional items are needed, any follow-up reminders um, until we get those documents will come through your EMISH um, email. So very important um, to check email. And another thing that I think is, is really important for financial aid, like I said, we're here to answer your questions, to go over the aid offer letter. Um, you know, if you're unsure of like, well, what's this mean as far as, you know, my cost, am I gonna owe anything? You know, what's the bottom line? Contact our office. But when you contact the Office of Financial Aid at, at Eastern, um, you can do that through a, a couple of different ways. So I may mention a, a few times tonight, you know, service EMU, that's something you're going to want to, you know, memorize, like whether you're a parent and your student saying, I have a question about financial aid and I don't know where to go, service EMU. Um, because service EMU is like a one-stop shop at Eastern and it's, they're located in our student center and they're able to answer any of your questions regarding financial aid, billing, um, and registration. So, you know, after you go to attend SOAR and register for classes, say you have a question because you need to adjust your schedule or something, you know, they're there to help you. Um, and then those individual offices, you know, the financial aid office, the student billing office, and the, registr the registrar's office, um, if you go to, and maybe Clarissa or Ashley can put this in the chat, um, Service EMU's website, their contact information for all of those individual offices are out there. So their phone numbers um, and their email addresses. Um, and I think, you know, that about sums it up. I hope it, I didn't take as much time as Alex did, but, but again, I mean, we're, we're here to answer your questions, um, you know, help you through this process, um, talk about what's next. I did have a, a question in the, the chat that, um, I can kind of generally answer in case there's any other scenarios out there like this. Um, you know, if you have a student or you are a student that has already attended college, um, so maybe your student's not a first time in college freshman um, and you'd be entering Eastern as a, a transfer student. Um, Alex, can you maybe talk a little bit about, you know, the transfer scholarship evaluation process? Absolutely. Absolutely. So opportunities for um, incoming first year students as well as transfer students are a little bit different um, based on the criteria that they're considered and then what the, the values of those awards are. So for our incoming transfer students, what we do is we evaluate them for scholarship during each semester um, that they're applying for. And scholarship criteria is going to be based on a transfer student's number of transferable credit hours that they're bringing with them into the institution, as well as their cumulative college college GPA. In order to be eligible for scholarships, transfer students have to have at least 30 transferable credits, as well as a 3.0 college GPA or higher. Um, those awards can range anywhere from $1,000 per year um, all the way up to $3,000 per year, and they are just based on those two criteria. Um, if you've applied to the university as a transfer student, we encourage you to make sure that you do so early. For our transfer students, for example, for the fall, um, scholarship deadline is June 1st for consideration for fall scholarships. And um, Donna, I know that um, another thing I wanted to throw back your way because we got one in the chat was wondering if you might be able to, and I'm not sure if this is in your wheelhouse, to talk a little bit about GI bills um, and how those are applied from a financial aid perspective. Yeah, I, I can't give a lot of detail about how it's um, applied through a financial aid perspective, but we do have our military veterans um, resource center and they do handle all of the certifications for our GI bills. Um, so I, we could probably put that link in the, the chat too, to their office. Um, but, you know, so if you're a dependent under the GI bill or if you're it, it's your benefit. You can contact that office. Um, Mike Wise is the 
the director of that office and he's able to complete the certification and um, that, that money is handled so the student really doesn't have to do much. The money just comes right to Eastern. We do the billing and there's no, um, not a lot that you have to do on the outside. So we handle most of it for you. It's just once that paperwork is filled out with the, the VA, our third party billing office is able to invoice them and, and get your tuition covered, so. There is a question in the chat box that I'm hoping that Donna, you'll respond to. Uh, the question is about how does a student apply for scholarships aside from those that they've been offered in their, um, through admissions? Well, I definitely encourage students to check any outside resource. Um, you know, their, your local, I mean, we have a local telephone company. I know those don't really exist much anymore, but, but your local organizations um, for any outside scholarship opportunities, your local community foundation, um, usually your high school, your high school counselor is very helpful in, in helping students apply for those. On our website, um, and we can share that in the link, we do have a couple scholarship pages where anything that we become aware of that might be available to Eastern students that's from an outside source, we will post out there. Um, so it's good to go check that periodically just to see if there's anything new that comes up. And then we also have a scholarship search engine where any of our departmental scholarships, because in addition to you know, our Emerald Scholarship or the EFOS scholarship that students might qualify for, which are institutional funds, we do have endowed funding. So there's departmental scholarships that may or may not require an application. Um, so on our website, we have a search engine where you can go in and put some information or you can search the various departments based on your interest to see what's available out there. And it depends, you know, on the time of year because departments might have, you know, different deadlines when they post anything. So again, it's, it's important to, to check that, you know, periodically just to, to make sure you're not missing out on anything. Um, and then, you know, there are your out, you know, there's other like free scholarship search services, and we have some links to those on our website as well, um, where you can just put in, you know, information and it'll give you scholarships that you may qualify for. And I know they say thousands of dollars go unspent, and, and it's true. Um, so if you qualify, it's worth, you know, writing, sitting down and writing an essay. Um, just to see if, if, you know, you might be maybe one or, you know, of two candidates that, that apply for that scholarship. So, you know, your chances could be pretty good. Um, so, yeah, I can, I can either put the link, Clarissa, or. I think I, I did add it in the chat box, okay. the um, emich.edu forward slash F-I-N-A-I-D. Yep, so family. Yeah, that's our general website. And then if you just click on scholarships, um, we'll have a featured, you know, there's a, a, a link where you can click on featured and that'll show you, like I said, any of those that we become aware of. And then there'll be, you know, our scholarship search engine, engines that are out there. Thank you. So Alex, I've got another question for you. So I have, this question has come up um, directly to me in the chat box, but I think it's a great general question that most families wonder. And it is, if a high school or transfer student is coming to Eastern, how will they know if they will receive credits for those particular classes? Excellent question. Excellent question. And I just want to, because I, 
I don't know that it can be said enough, um, but I wanted to kind of also tag this on Donna's response um, about outside scholarships and, and applying for those and how much we can encourage students to really look into those things. I always tell a story a couple of years ago, I worked with a young lady who she worked through her college search process and she applied for 50 different outside scholarships um, that she went through her process and applied for. And in truth be told in the conversations with her, um, I didn't say this out loud, but she used the same essay for a lot of those applications. Um, and she ended up getting 13 of them. And she almost paid for her entire room and board um, just by applying for these outside scholarships. Donna's so right. There's so many opportunities out there. and We encourage students to go and look for them. Um, but coming to that question, Clarissa, because it's a big, important question, not only for our transfer students, but for first year students as well. We're seeing it so common that you may have been working through an earlier middle college program. You may have been dual enrolling and you may be bringing credits with you into the university. And there's a couple of ways to get good information about that. The first one is that East Eastern Michigan is incredibly transfer friendly. Um, we, we love the fact that students are doing uh, work and advancing their education before they get to us. So we want you to bring that credit to us. The only thing that we have to have in order to award a student credit is we have to have an official transcript from the college or university where you obtain the credit. In order for us to allow transfer credit, the general criteria is that it has to come from a regionally or nationally accredited college. It has to be at least a 100 level course or above, and the student has to receive a C or better. So if it meets those three criteria, chances are we're going to give you some kind of credit for it. And the really great thing is for a lot of our students, because I've seen a few in the chat that are working through programs at local colleges that are here in the state of Michigan, we have an amazing transfer equivalency tool on our website that you can actually use and go through the equivalencies one-on-one. -on -one. So we actually have a process where you can sit down with your transcript, you can type in the exact class that you took at the community college and it will spit out the EMU equivalency for that. So you can actually find those resources at emish.edu slash transfer um, and you can actually go through your courses or if you'd like to do that with us, reach out. We would be more than happy to sit and go through your transfer credits with you and talk about the things that are going to come over and maybe the things that will not. Um, but if you'd like to do it at home by yourself, I know that the link just went up in the chat. Feel free to check that out. It's a really great tool. It allows you to do some exploring. I mean, I know we got a specific uh, question about, um, about the early college programs. Um, that's one of the great ones that we do. And one of the things I always like to clear up about the early college programs is that in all processes and procedures, you will be considered a first year student. However, you still get to bring in your transfer credit and we will still give you your appropriate class standing for the transfer credit that you're bringing in. However, when it comes to orientation, when it comes to financial aid and scholarships, you will go through the process just like every other first year student will. You'll just be starting a little bit further along in your credits. Excellent. Thank you. So back to the financial aid side, <laughs> I'm getting questions, they, and, and this is great, I love this. Um, I'm getting some students that are asking questions about how financial aid and or, or excuse me, how scholarships are applied to their bill. For example, I have a question here that asks more specifically about how EFOS is applied to the student bill and how the Emerald Scholarship is applied to the bill, and if a student may have the ability to apply other types of aid to other expenses, so. Okay, that is a, an excellent question. So what will happen when you attend SOAR and you're registered for classes, and, and then it'll seem like there'll be this like, you know, long period of time where, where not a lot happens, but come July, and I think it's usually around that first or second week of July, the university will assess tuition. And that's when your bill becomes like viewable and you'll be able to see, you know, exactly like what your tuition charges are on your student account, um, whether there's any additional fees, if you're living on campus, housing charges, all of that will be detailed on your what's called your e-bill. And, and at the same time, 
any aid that you have been awarded, such as your EFOS scholarship um, your, or an Emerald scholarship or a federal Pell Grant, that is, I'll use the words, good to go. Like you've met all of, if any outstanding requirements have been met, everything's in place um, for your aid, you know, your aid is finalized. It will show as authorized on that billing statement. And you'll see that you have your Emerald or EFOS is authorized to pay towards your charges. That way the, the billing office knows like that's money that's going to be coming in and, and applied to your student account so that they're not gonna require you to pay out of pocket. We won't actually pay the money or disperse that money until 10 days prior to the beginning of the fall semester. Um, that's when, you know, legally the federal government allows us to actually apply that funding to your tuition and your room and board charges. Um, so, so really, as long as you meet those outstanding requirements, if you have any, and everything is in place, you don't have to do anything. You know, it automatically will apply towards your, your charges. If you have outside scholarships that you know are gonna be coming in. And a lot of times outside scholarships will still come in like the form of a check. Um, and you need to know like where to send it. So if you have, you know, from your local community foundation, you, you got a scholarship for a thousand dollars, they can send that check to the financial aid office. Um, they would send it to Eastern Michigan University Financial Aid Office, 403 Pierce Hall, we can put that in the chat. Um, and that is also on our, our website that Clarissa shared earlier. Um, that way that chat comes directly to our office and we apply it to your account and towards your balance. Now, say for example, um, that chat comes, you've also got an Emerald Scholarship that gets applied to your account but you want that check to go towards, you know, books, because I think that was part of the question, like how do you, you know, if you have other scholarships, apply them towards other charges. Um, that necessarily, that's not as easy. Um, that would depend on your entire aid package and if it covers all of your, you know, tuition charges and room and board if you have any. So, there's really not a lot of like leeway when it comes to if you want those scholarships to apply to other things. It really depends on the scholarship um, and the, the restrictions, you know, because some scholarships will come in and say, this is for tuition only, um, or this is for tuition or direct expenses only, you know, so like we aren't able to allow you to use it for other things. Um, we try um, is the best we can. So say, for example, we have a student who has an EFOS scholarship where your Pell Grant and your EFOS covers your tuition charges, but then we get a scholarship that comes in from an outside source that says it's tuition only. Well, if you live on campus um, or have a meal plan, we'll try to make sure that we we, you know, divert your, your EFOS scholarship, for example, to allow that to maybe pay towards your room and board so the outside scholarship can go towards your tuition charges. We're going to do everything that's within our, our, you know, legal ability to, to give you the maximum, you know, dollars for your scholarships that you're eligible for. I hope that helped answer your question and didn't confuse things anymore, but um, so yeah, so that's the process. And student loans. So when you're going through that aid offer, same thing. If you, you know, are you taking student loans to help cover some of your educational costs or your parents are borrowing uh, a federal parent loan to cover that, as long as all the requirements are met, um, which is we would have on the, you know, those outstanding requirements, those will get applied automatically to your account. There's really Nothing that you have to do to get the money here except, you know, meeting those outstanding requirements. I have a, a direct question that came that kind of piggybacks on that. And then I have another one for you as well, Alex. So uh, the question from the audience was about the 
presidential scholarship scholars and a, a presidential scholar who's on the call this evening awesome congratulations on that um asked the question about stacking scholarships specifically about pell grant and being able to utilize pell grant for books or other types of expenses so that's that's the question from that person and then while i've, I've got that there alex um there's a lot of questions around what scholarships require students to live on campus. So if you'll be <laughs> ready to, to respond to that one. So Donna about the presidential scholarship, please. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, congratulations to our, our presidential scholar that we have with us tonight. And yes, yeah, so a presidential scholarship, as you are well aware, covers your tuition and your room and board charges. If you file a, a free application for federal student aid or in our federal Pell Grant eligible, we do stack the federal Pell Grant. So that would be on top of your, your presidential scholarship. Once, you know, everything happens in July, tuition's assessed, we disperse aid 10 days prior to the start of the semester. Usually the, you know, I won't guarantee, but usually the Friday afternoon before classes begin in the fall, any excess funding that's that's left over from, you know, say your federal Pell Grant would be refunded to you as a student and you could use that to purchase books. Um, but it would not happen any sooner than in usually that Friday afternoon before the, the first day of class for the fall semester. Um, so yeah, I'll turn it over to Alex now. Yeah, absolutely. Students love refund day. Okay. Um, so uh, the question that we are that we've gotten a couple of times, I'm told, is is about living requirements, um, and it's an awesome question. And I actually kind of want to answer two questions at the same time because they're two really popular questions. And and the first one, I think, which is kind of the crux of the of the second one, is are first year students required to live on campus? Um, and I think I wanna start there. So the first thing is that first year students are required to live on campus unless they choose to commute from home where they live with a parent or guardian, and that home needs to be within 50 miles of our campus. If you live within 50 miles with a parent or guardian, you are more than welcome to commute during your first year of school. Now, we try to give students as much flexibility as possible. Um, students that live outside of that 50 mile radius, they are required to live on campus during the first year. After the first year, they're welcome to stay with us and we're happy to provide housing all the way through a student's career with us at Eastern. Um, or anyone who has been in our area knows that our campus is pretty densely surrounded by apartment complexes and um, um, it's a very historic city if you haven't been in Ypsilanti. So there are a lot of old homes that have been turned into apartments and our students inhabit the vast majority of the space that is in about a half mile radius of the campus. So there's a lot of opportunity to live on and off campus for our students while they're here. Um, if students do commute from home during the first year, that doesn't rule them out of living on campus in the future. They might want to commute during their first year, but maybe they want to come and live on campus with us during their second year. Um, we're also very excited that um, the university has just announced that over the next four years, um, we're going to be implementing about $250 million worth of renovations, um, including new halls on our campus. So we're very exciting about new or excited about new residence options that'll be available for our students as you all move through your careers you'll see those things become available to you as well um, but that is the general policy within 50 miles moving over to the scholarship question um, the scholarship question is do i have to live on campus in order to get either my emerald or my education first opportunity scholarship and the answer to that question is no if you live within a commutable distance, neither of those scholarships have an on-campus living requirement. We always often talk to students that are in our area because the Education First Scholarship along with the Pell Grant does pay for the full cost of tuition. We often tell students that are within a commutable distance, if they choose to commute from home, essentially it takes care of the vast majority of the cost that they're going to incur while they're here with us because they don't have to incur those room and board costs. However, if they choose to live on campus, They'll just be looking at those room and board costs in advance, but you do not have to live on campus in order to get either of those scholarships. They are both tuition-based awards. Um, 
we got another question that came in about scholarships that I see here. Um, and it says, um, is it true that if you live on campus for all four years that your last two years of tuition are free? That can be true. Um, we have a scholarship here at Eastern Michigan available to our students that is called the Forward Graduation Scholarship. And the Forward Graduation Scholarship is an award that we devised a couple of years ago to help provide families with a little bit more flexibility, depending on their scholarship and as well as their financial flexibility as they're going into the college process. The way the scholarship works is that if a student opts into the Forward Scholarship, they will be opting into that award while simultaneously forfeiting any other academic or merit scholarships that they're receiving from the institution. So if a student does the forward scholarship, they would be not accepting their Emerald, their Education First scholarship, presidential, any other scholarships cannot be stacked with the forward scholarship. But the way the forward scholarship works is that the student would come in and they pay for the first two years of tuition. And then we pay for the second two years of tuition. It's essentially kind of a buy to get to free kind of program. But the other thing that goes along with qualifying for the program is that this is a scholarship that's focused on allowing students to stay in school and graduate in four years. And because of that, we do require that the student live on campus for all four years while they're in school, and they are responsible for paying for room and board for all four years of school. So essentially, the student's responsible for two years of tuition and four years of room and board, and in a response, they get two years of tuition paid for by the university. Um, this is a really good option um, for families that may have a little bit more ability to pay some of the upfront costs and then could uh, afford to wait to see that scholarship really kick in on those last two years. Um, the reason the scholarship was developed is because we got a lot of feedback from families telling us, you know, we have a college fund or we have some money saved up to really get us through the first two but years three and four, the money starts to run short. So what do we do? So we tried to provide some more flexibility with this scholarship. And I believe um, that we actually, um, we unfortunately had to lose Clarissa because she actually had another admissions event that she had to pop over to. Um, so I am now your designated MC for the rest of the evening. Uh, so we'll continue to look for questions as they're coming through the chat. Um, and I know that one that we got earlier, Donna, that I would love for you to take a little stab at and talk a little bit about um, is a little bit about student loans. Um, we actually just did a webinar this last week where we talked a lot about student loans, but maybe you can give us a little bit of a Reader's Digest version. The questions that we've got here, um, there's one about the differences between the different types of student loans, um, subsidized, unsubsidized, what does that actually mean? Um, and then we got another one about how, how does a, a parent initiate the process if they're interested in a parent plus loan? Okay, for sure. I can talk about that. Um, yeah, so student loans. So if you received your, your financial aid offer letter, you may see one or, or two different types of student loans on there that you are eligible for. As a, a first time in college um, student, you're eligible to take out $5,500 for the year. And that could be a combination of a federal subsidized or a federal unsubsidized loan. Um, so like I said, you may have both subsidized and unsubsidized loan eligibility on your aid offer, or it may all fall under the unsubsidized. Subsidized means that interest is just that subsidized while you're in school. So interest is not charged on that loan amount while you are in school. And interest does not begin accruing on that loan until six months after you graduate. And that's when you would start like monthly payments on the principal and then interest would start accruing at that point in time. Unsubsidized is a little different. Obviously, it means that it's unsubsidized. The government is not subsidizing interest on that loan while you're in school. So any amount that you borrow under the unsubsidized loan program is accruing interest um, while you're in school. Same as the subsidized loan. I mean, both loans are guaranteed. You know, there's no credit check required to get them. Um, both loans don't start repayment until six months after you graduate or cease to enroll, at least as a half-time student, um, during the fall or winter semester. Um, but unsubsidized, the amount will start accruing interest while you're in school. If you, you, 
interest is capitalized once at, at repayment. So for those of you that are, are you know, financially savvy, it's you're not going to be accruing interest on top of interest the whole time you're in school. Um, so that is a good thing about the unsubsidized loan program. Um, so yeah, both are great programs. It's just one, you know, will cost you a little bit more because there's some interest up to it. Now, as far as a Parent PLUS loan, which you most of you will have on your, your aid offer letter, um, Parent PLUS loans, just as it says, the parent, the parent is the one borrowing the money um, to help you, you know, meet that gap that you need to, to take care of your cost um, to attend Eastern. The Parent PLUS loan process is a little different you still have to accept the loan on, you know, like the instructions say on your, your EMISH account where you go in and, and basically web accept that loan amount. But then you have to, your parent, not you, the student, the parent goes out to a website, studentaid.gov, and will be sending instructions. So you don't need to like, you know, write this down and worry about it. You can't do it yet. Um, and they will actually apply for the federal parent loan where the Department of Education will conduct a credit check to determine whether or not they can approve that loan. And then the parent will have to fill out a master promissory note. Same thing, you know, once it's processed, the money will come to us. There's nothing that will have to be, you know, you'll have to do on your end after those, those requirements are complete. Um, but that process doesn't start until May 1st. So even if right now you've, you've gone in and you've done everything, you've accepted your your loan eligibility on your My EMISH account and your parent, you know, you've accepted the parent loan eligibility, your parent will still need to, to do those steps outside of, of Eastern's website. Um, what we will do usually around that first week in May, um, we'll, anybody that's gone out and accepted a parent loan, we will send a letter home, a paper letter, that will provide detailed instructions on the steps that need to be taken in order to complete that parent loan process, um, which would be, again, you know, going through that credit check process and also, you know, filling out the actual, you know, loan application and the master promissory note. Um, if for some reason, you know, your parent that applies for that loan is not able to get approved because they, they didn't pass the credit check, that does offer you, the student, a little bit more loan eligibility in the unsubsidized loan program that we just talked about. So if you're in a situation where you think, well, I know my parent, you know, we need some additional money because we, we don't have enough to cover all of our, our costs, but I know if my, my mom applies for the loan, it's gonna get denied. Um, I would encourage, you know, mom to still apply for the loan because that denial does allow us to give you some increased eligibility as a student. Um, again, if you, you know, have any questions or think that that might be a situation that you're in, I, I would encourage you to reach out to our office, you know, sooner than later so that we can kind of talk to you about that process. Um, I think that, does that answer, you know, the question, Alex? Yeah, I think you answered it great. Yeah. Um, now, I know we've got about uh, 10 more minutes left. So um, if anybody does have extra questions, please feel free, throw them in the chat. We want to make sure we get through as many as we do before we close out. So make sure you throw them in there. Um, but the, the next one that I saw that I'm going to go ahead and take uh, this one, Donna, is, um, is there a confirmation deadline? And if not, when do we need to pay a deposit by? Great question. And the big answer is that there is not a stringent deposit or, or confirmation deadline here at EMU. A couple of things to note on that, though, that I, I always like to go over with students as we're talking about what their timeline looks like and when are you thinking about making a decision? When do you need to do that by? Um, just a little bit of advice on our side. The first thing is you will notice that May 1st is pretty nationally recognized as National College Decision Day. So you will see that most colleges across the United States use that as a pre-universal deadline for students to make their decisions. While we do not hold that as a stringent deadline, we always encourage students that that's a good timeline to keep yourself on. Um, but my, my personal opinion on this is always going to be this. We want you to make the decision 
in a timeline that you are comfortable making that decision. We want you to have the conversations with your family. We want you to think about this. This is a big decision and we get that. Um, ask us the questions, ask the other schools the questions, make sure you have the information that you need and make the decision when you feel comfortable making the decision. With that said, I always say that as soon as you make that decision, let's get moving. Um, and the reason is that here in March, we're going to start having our SOAR or our student orientation advising and registration dates. And that's where students are going to register for classes. Obviously, the earlier you come in, the more pick of the litter of classes that you have when you're looking toward the fall. So what we tell students is we certainly don't want to rush that decision process on you. We want you to take it very seriously. We want you to make a good decision. But as soon as you've made that decision and you've said, yep, Eastern's the place for me. This is where I'm going to be in the fall. Great. Let's start working on those next steps and let's get you signed up for a SOAR date so that we can start taking care of the things that come next. Um, for example, another step in addition to filling out your EMU enrollment form and attending your SOAR date is going to be that the housing application is going to become available on April 4th at 10 a.m. for our first year students. So we wanna make sure that if you're planning on getting signed up for housing, that you're able to do that right when the application becomes available. Um, but as soon as you're ready to make that decision, let us know, we'll work with you, or we'll make sure that um, you have everything that you need to work through that process at home by yourself. Um, the last part of that is when is the deposit due? We do not collect an enrollment deposit here at EMU. You do not have to pay us anything to lock in your spot. All you have to do is complete your EMU enrollment form. Um, the only deposit deposit that we collect here at Eastern is we do collect a $150 non-refundable housing prepayment. So if you are planning on living on campus, there is a $150 prepayment due at the time of application. And we want to make sure um, that we have that in. Uh, the housing prepayment does go toward your housing costs if you do join us for the fall as planned. All right. And I have got another um, another question that's coming through for Donna over here. So I'm hoping that maybe you can talk a little bit about this, Donna. Um, what if I've got questions and I am, am just trying to figure out, hey, how do I work my way through and how do I pay for all of this and how do I navigate the finances? Um, I think that's kind of what the question is, is just who do I talk to? Is there somebody available on campus who can sit down and go through all of it with me? Um, I, I think that that's kind of what the question is getting to here. Absolutely. The answer is absolutely. And, and you have options. We can, you know, sit down in person. So I talked a little bit about Service EMU. If you wanted to make a trip to campus, Service EMU is open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. There are advisors there that are able to, you know, go through the aid offer with you and go over options. We also have financial aid advisors available on the phone. Um, it, the number would be in your aid offer letter, but I'm going to put it in the chat as well because I want to make sure everyone has it. Um, Can't talk and type at the same time, um, but that is a direct line to our financial aid advisors, and they are available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and they can go over the aid package with you, um, talk about options, and don't hesitate, you know, to call. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention um, is we do take like, so when you filled out the free application for federal student aid, the FAFSA, you used prior, prior year income. So you used income information from your, you or your parents from the year 2020. Well, life happens. We know things change. Um, maybe your, you know, anticipated 2022 income is going to be different. Maybe dad got laid off or mom, you know, lost her job or, you know, there could be, you know, a number of things that may have happened in your life that have changed. Um, don't, you know, my, my 
best advice I can give, don't give up. Don't be like, oh, well, it is what it is. And we filled out that FAFSA and, and this is our aid package and we're stuck. Um, we have on our website, which we shared earlier, and it's right on the front page. And it says, if you have special circumstances, we can take those into consideration. And there are some cases, and it doesn't happen all the time, but there are some cases where we can actually make changes to the information that you reported on the FAFSA um, based on these, you know, life altering things that have happened to you since, you know, 2020 when, you know, that income information that you had to share. So it's called the special circumstance request form. And if you fill that out and submit it, and it's, a, it's an electronic form, then a financial aid advisor will reach out to you and have that conversation. Um, to determine whether or not, you know, we, we do want to take the next steps to, you know, investigate making changes to the FAFSA to see if it might open up some, you know, different aid opportunities for you. So, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're, we're definitely here to help. Um, when you attend SOAR, um, because I'm sure every one of you are going to attend SOAR this spring, um, Service EMU is also going to be open. So you will have opportunities on that day um, to, you know, go through everything with an advisor as well. So, um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Donna. Uh -huh. um, and one more thing that I want to run by you, because I think I have the right answer, but we had another question from our presidential scholar in the group about whether or not um, their presidential scholarship covers their housing deposit. I believe the answer to that question is no, but can you confirm that for me? Oh, th that is a tough one. Um, I think I believe the answer is no, but what it is, so you'll pay the, the, the prepayment, the $150 prepayment, and then when your presidential scholarship disperses in the fall, the 10, you know, when I talked about 10 days prior to the start of classes, you end up getting the money back. So it covers it, but you, it's more of a reimbursement. You have to pay it up front, and then once we award the presidential scholarship, you you essentially will get that hundred and fifty dollars back. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Donna. Um, and I do want to say one more time, um, thank you all so much for being with us today. We hope that the information was helpful. And really, the, the last thought that we're going to give you, and I know we've both said it a couple of times, um, is please let us know how we can be helpful to you. I think that with our session tonight, this is really just about giving you a place to answer or to ask the questions that you have. But know that just tonight is not all that you have. You're welcome to reach out to our offices. We'd love to sit down with you. We'd love to see you in person. We know that we're going to see you in the fall, but we want to talk to you as much as we can before then. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us and let us know how we can be helpful as you go through. One last time, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. And with that, we're going to make sure that everybody can get to their evening plans. Um, thank you so much, and we hope to see you on campus soon, but everybody have a wonderful night.